Hi, Malcolm. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you today? Very good, thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation for the course. Of course. It should be fun, or I hope it is fun. It's going to be. I'm certainly that it's going to be. Thank you. So you have had three lectures in the series so far, is that correct? Uh, lectures to... Uh, so Annemiek Heluk, John Spencer have already yes. presented. Yeah. Flavio Lara and also four, four lectures. <clears throat> okay. You have Annemiek, John Spencer, Flavio Lara and... Uh, uh, I forgot the... Cast da Madre. Okay. Very good. The first one, okay. Next week we'll have Robert Modling mm -hmm. and Andre Kipnis, and uh, one more week. And we have more, four more lectures. Busy, busy. Hi, Malcolm. Hi, Roberta. Hey, Veronica. Hey, Veronica. How are you? I'm fine. And you? Did you get my email from last night, Veronica? Yes, yes. Okay. I read today in the morning. I don't know if Milton have opportunity to read. I didn't uh, talk to him. Yeah, I spoke to him about all of those issues last week, actually. So he, he's aware. Yeah, we missed uh, the call last uh, Monday because of the time zone, summertime, something like this. Oh, yeah, because the United States just moved time, which is always yeah. confusing. I always get worried, any <laughs> especially in Brazil. Yeah, because, because of the half hour difference in the middle. <laughs> yes. yes, and we didn't have summertime this year, and I think yeah. that will be canceled forever. I don't know. I think summertime's canceled everywhere right now, <laughs> unfortunately. <gasps> yes. I will try my best to make sure the dogs, my dogs don't interrupt, but there are no guarantees, unfortunately. Malcolm, please, uh, five minutes to people enter. Okay? No problem. Yep. Thank you. I'll just go on mute.
Good afternoon. It's an honor for us to have here today, Dr. Malcolm Dutz. I would like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And now I would ask Hannah to introduce Dr. Malcolm. Thank you again, Malcolm. Hi, Hi everyone. Um... Today, uh, we are honored to have Dr. Malcolm Dutty with us. Um, Dr. Dutty got uh, his graduation in immunology from the University of Glasgow and uh, his PhD in medical microbiology from the University of uh, Edinburgh. Um, he worked for a long time at the Infectious Disease Research Institute uh, with an immune response to, to penicillin mercury uh, in the development of a scene for leprosy and uh, leishmaniosis and also he worked with uh, development of diagnosis of hand, uh, leprosy and Chaga disease. He's currently vice president of uh, HDT Biotech Corporation, development uh, therapies aiming on the, at the host immune defense to two and two associated with leprosy and influenza, influenza detection and vaccination. Again, it's a pleasure to have, uh, to have you with us and um, feel free to start. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, so today, um, in the next hour and a half, two hours, uh, I would like to go through um, various diagnostic test formats with an emphasis on mycobacterial diseases. Uh, each has its own distinct advantages and their own distinct disadvantages. And to begin, uh, I'd like to just introduce the, the concept of various different different diagnostic tests, and then I'll ask everybody a question um, to keep secret until the end. Uh, so there are a variety of different strategies that can be uh, taken to diagnosing any infectious disease. Um, fundamentally, they break down into either direct detection systems where the pathogen itself is detected or uh, a live or living component of the um, pathogen is detected. 
uh, exam the cleanest and most simple example is microscopy where the pathogen can be extracted from the infected individual and visualized uh, or the pathogen can be extracted and then cultured uh, in the lab uh, to confirm that the individual was indeed infected uh, with living um, pathogen. Antigen detection uh, is a strategy whereby a component of the pathogen, in the case today, various different microbacteria uh, are detected um, using the rationale that those particular proteins or glycolipids can only be in the individual because they are infected with the pathogen. And then more recently, over the last couple of decades, nucleic acid amplification tests uh, have become very prevalent in the diagnostic field. Uh, these tests uh, detect either DNA or RNA related to the pathogen, again, showing that there is something directly related to the infection that can be measured. Indirect strategies uh, revolve predominantly around detection of the immune response against the pathogen of interest. Uh, in their simplest form, these are antibody detection tests uh, using the rationale that antibodies are induced during the infection and therefore can serve as a surrogate indicator of the infection itself. Um, again, a more recent development is expansion into the T-cell arm of immunity uh, where antigen-specific T-cells um, can be detected and are, again are indicative of infection with the pathogen of interest. And then in addition to that, other, bio, other general biomarkers or other strategies are used. Um, so I would like at this point for everybody to think about what they would consider to be the best diagnostic test format. Uh, and I, I want you to put that in the back of your head and we'll come back to at the end of the lecture. So, <clears throat> as I said, the focus today is on mycobacterial infections and the diseases they cause. Um, there are a plethora of mycobacteria that cause infection and disease in humans uh, and also in uh, animals. Uh, the most obvious or, or best known is mycobacterium tuberculosis, the causative agent of TB, tuberculosis, uh, predominantly a lung infection, uh, ultimately causing a pneumonia, uh, but tuberculosis can also um, become secondary and ex extra pulmonary, uh, leading to cutaneous tuberculosis, tuberculosis in various tissues throughout the body. Um, so we'll use tuberculosis as one example. Uh, there are a variety of mycobacterial species that actually cause tuberculosis-like diseases. Uh, amongst them, Mycobacterium bovis, uh, which is the backbone of the Mycobacterium bovis bacille kamet guerin uh, vaccine that is used to actually prevent tuberculosis. Uh, there are also a plethora of non-tuberculous tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, these cause diseases predominantly immune, in immunocompromised people or and uh, individuals who are immune suppressed. Uh, again, a variety of these are found in nature. Uh, the most prevalent is within the Mycobacterium avium complex. Um, and these are associated with uh, diseases in individuals suffering from cystic fibrosis or immune compromised HIV infected individuals. Uh, predominantly. So in and of themselves, they're not particularly contagious or virulent, but they take advantage of an immune suppressed environment. And then in addition to these, uh, I've separated out Mycobacterium leprae, the causative, causative agent of leprosy or hentianase, uh, and then also Mycobacterium ulcerans, which causes the disease Beruli ulcer, uh, which I will go through in a little detail. So having introduced uh, the, the family, these particular species, it's important to consider the diseases that are actually caused by them. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, as I said, uh, the primary cause of TB, uh, the disease presents as a, a cough, a persistent cough, fever, chest pains, uh, quite generic symptoms, um, 
and then ultimately the um, patient is diagnosed with tuberculosis based on a pneumonia within the lung and that can be seen in the x-ray on the right here. The next disease that we'll focus in on in terms of diagnostics is Hanchionase caused by Mycobacterium leprae. Um, this disease presents in a variety of different forms um, across a very diverse immunological and clinical spectrum. Um, but classically, the first symptoms are fading um, uh, of the patches within the skin that then become anesthetic. Uh, individuals lose touch uh, due to the nerve damage that occurs. Uh, this can also lead to muscle weakness. Um, and both of these can impact um, the individual's vision. And, and in the worst cases, individuals uh, can present with claw hands, they can damage uh, their fingers because of the loss of sensation. And this can lead to the um, unfortunate loss of the digit or, or loss of function of the hand. And then the last uh, example that we'll run through today is Mycobacterium ulcerans. And the causative agent of Beruli ulcer. This is localized in Western Africa and Northern Australia. Uh, this infection causes uh, blistering on the skin and ultimately these huge necrotic lesions where the skin is essentially eaten up um, due to the mycobacterium ulcer and secreting uh, a toxin called mycolactone. So you can see that Across these three examples, the disease presentations are very different and, and obviously in need of a diagnostic effort because we would like to prevent the infection from advancing to these very severe cases um, that cause death in TB patients, cause loss of digits in leprosy patients, uh, and cause loss of digits or amputation in Beruli ulcer patients. So when we think, uh, again, when we think about diagnostic test formats, it's important to think about what is the purpose of the diagnosis? What are we going to do with the information that we gain from the test? Uh, are we going to provide an individual a treatment? Are we monitoring progression of disease? Are we identifying people that are infected but have not yet uh, displayed symptoms? And what do we do in that example? Uh, it's also important to think about the resources that we have uh, and how we can apply these diagnostic tests. Um, in a system where we would be trying to detect infection, the surveillance, um, we clearly wouldn't want to be doing that within an expert facility, or, or we would like to take it away from an expert facility so that the experts can actually get on with what they're experts at. Um, and then it's also important as we come back through that spectrum to think about the technical requirements of such testing platforms. Can we actually enact the test of interest with the facilities that we have? So that's what I'm going to uh, try and go through within all of these different diagnostic test formats in the context of mycobacterium infections. So again, just to reiterate, we have direct detection systems, we have indirect detection systems, uh, and the focus today is going to be the relative strengths and weaknesses of each platform. So microscopy, um, obviously fairly regarded as fairly simple uh, for us as bench scientists, uh, this would be extremely rudimentary. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, it is enacted within uh, a variety of clinics uh, to provide diagnoses. Um, to conduct microscopy, um, again, very simple. We need to collect a sample. We need to then prepare that sample. And then in the case of detection of mycobacterium, uh, we can apply uh, Zeal-Nielsen stains uh, so that we can actually visualize these rod-shaped mycobacterium uh, upon microscopy. And then another requirement uh, that's often overlooked um, within the scientific field is the expertise of the microscopist and the experience of that microscopist in looking at a slide and de actually detecting these 
rod shaped uh, bacilli. Uh, so the factors that can impact uh, the microscopist's ability to do that uh, are impacted by the sample collection, the quality of the stain, the quality of the microscope, and general experience. So in the case of Mycobacterium tuberculosis infection, um, as I said, it's predominantly a pulmonary infection localized within the lungs. So that requires collection of a sample from within the lung. And in the case of TB, that involves collection of sputum that can be coughed up by the suspected uh, TB patient. Uh, that involves a rinsing of the mouth, um, some deep inhalations uh, supported by coughing, and then actual expulsion of that sputum into a collection container, a sample of which is then subjected to the uh, Zeal Nielsen stain, as I said, uh, put on a microscope slide, and then um, the microscopist analyzes that. And examples of what the microscopist would see are shown here, highlighted by these black arrows. We can see these pink rod-like bacilli within this sample. Um, I would challenge many people um, to be able to see these pink spots if these black arrows weren't conveniently added in here. So let's think about that in the context of uh, the impact of microscopy and the importance of that actual microscopist in achieving the diagnosis. Uh, and it's because of these uh, issues that microscopy is only about 50% um, sensitive in the diagnosis of mycobacterium tuberculosis. Other factors that can impact um, the ability of microscopy or, or just the uh, ability to collect sample is there is often a pure quality of sputum. Um, if, if the sputum is not sufficiently uh, collected, we're not going to be able to detect those mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis within it. And then when it comes to kids um, or even elderly individuals who, who are uh, relatively frail, um, the ability to actually expel sputum is complicated uh, and it can lead to uh, the need for nebulizers to free up the sputum. It can lead to the need for uh, suction cups to collect that sputum. Uh, so all things that can complicate the diagnostic process and moving towards collection of a sputum sample for microscopy. Um, as I said, TB is predominantly a pul pulmonary disease, but it in, in many um, or a significant proportion of cases, it becomes extrapulmonary. Um, extrapulmonary TB can often be the primary presentation uh, such that there are no mycobacterium tuberculosis within the lungs. Uh, it can cause a cutaneous infection. It can cause uh, infection in the pleural cavity. And again, the collection of the sample there becomes much more complicated because now we're gonna to have to do invasion and tapping into the pleural cavity to extract pleural um, liquid that can be submitted to microscopy. In the case of mycobacterium leprae infection, uh, Hansen is, um, the patient presents uh, with lesions or, or nodules uh, that are suspected by the clinician to um, be related to leprosy. Uh, what happens in, in these patients is the region is prepared, it's washed off, and then what you can't see very well here is a scalpel is taken uh, to do what is called a skin split. Um, the lesion is then squeezed to collect lymphatic uh, fluid from it that is then subjected to microscopy uh, again after a staining event. And in the case of lepromatous leprosy patients, they have sufficient mycobacterium leprae within their lesions to be able to visualize them very well under a uh, microscope. So we would have a microscopic confirmation of uh, diagnosis of leprosy here. The problem uh, with leprosy is that, as I said, it's a spectral disease um, with varying immune responses and varying uh, infection levels. Uh, so whilst the lepromatous leprosy um, patients have 
lots and lots of bacteria in their systems that are detected after skin slit smears or after collection of a biopsy from their lesion. We can see them in microscopy. Individuals at the tuberculoid pole of the infection have very low levels of bacteria in their systems, even though they display disease symptoms. Uh, and these can be much more difficult to detect uh, through um, immuno uh, histochemistry in this example. Uh, so we see here one mycobacterium leprae within this sample from a tuberculo uh, tuberculoid leprosy patient versus the um, large number of mycobacterium detected in the lepromatous patients. And this cartoon makes a, a biopsy look fairly simple. Uh, I wanted to give the graphic of that. Um, we would um, mark the lesion, um, anesthetize it so that we could actually do a punch biopsy, uh, typically uh, somewhere in the region of a six to 10 millimeter punch biopsy uh, obtained with this by pushing it into the skin and extracting a, a, essentially a dermal plug uh, that is then subjected to this microscopy. So again, uh, it's considered moderately invasive, but I would challenge anybody to say they would uh, gladly and willingly submit to this as a diagnostic strategy. Uh, and again, considering of this in kids, it can lead to scarring. For mycobacterium ulcerans infection, Baruli ulcer, uh, these are extreme cases shown in the left panel here. Um, but the simplest consideration here is where the heck would you pull a biopsy from in these individuals when the skin has basically been decimated? And, and the impact of where you collect that sample from um, is significant in the diagnostic process because if you collect from without the infected region, you're obviously going to miss the uh, mycobacterium ulcerans. And we can see here in the right-hand panel that the depth of that biopsy can impact our ability to actually detect the mycobacterium. Um, so we have uh, going through the uh, presenting lesions, uh, we have to go deeper to be able to see the mycobacterium ulcerans in them. So um, if we recognize the complicated, the, the obvious attributes of micro, uh, microscopy are direct detection, direct visualization of the pathogen uh, to confirm the infection uh, as suspected by their clinical presentation. The, the obvious detrimental impact is the um, need to collect samples in such a way and the requirement for high quality microscopes and high quality microscopists to support that diagnosis. Now, to satisfy a Cox postulate, uh, ideally we would be able to extract the pathogen uh, from the infected individual, again, going through those issues of how we go about collecting the sample. Uh, we would then culture the uh, pathogen uh, and show outgrowth on agar plates or in broth uh, and have a bacteriologist to confirm uh, the infecting agent. Uh, so in a classic bacterial infection, uh, we simply collect the sample we culture it for hours or days, um, going through a logarithmic growth phase of the uh, bacterium that we introduce into the growth broth. Uh, and then these um, that bacterial growth can be visualized just by a, a change in the appearance of the broth, or, or the bacteria can be streaked on plates and confirmed that way. In the examples of mycobacterium tuberculosis infection, again, we have issues of the poor quality of a sputum impacting the ability to culture it out. Uh, the mycobacterium, the suspected mycobacterium tuberculosis sample is inoculated into a low thing against in media. Uh, mycobacterium leprae, or mycobacterium tuberculosis rather, is a slow growing uh, bacteria relative to E. coli or Staphylococcus uh, with a doubling time in the region of um, 16 to 20 hours. So culture of MTB to confirm a diagnosis of tuberculosis typically takes upward up to four weeks. In some instances, it can take up to eight weeks for the outgrowth of that mycobacterium TB within the um, 
inoculum. Clearly, if you're a tuberculosis patient, you don't want to wait one month or longer to have confirmation of your uh, diagnosis. So this is a downside to the culture of mycobacterium tuberculosis for confirmation of uh, the diagnosis of TB. In the case of mycobacterium leprae, uh, this is a very blank slide deliberately. A sample would be collected. It would be grown on uh, agar or broths, but to date, no conditions have been identified that permit the in vitro culture of mycobacterium leprae. Uh, the strategy that was used many, many years ago was to inoculate the sample into immune deficient mice. Uh, the predicted doubling time of mycobacterium leprae is much, much slower even than the slow growing mycobacterium TB with a doubling time somewhere in the region of 14 days. So by placing the uh, sample into immune deficient mice, it can take eight to 18 months for outgrowth and recognition of um, impact of the infection in those animals to render confirmation of the diagnosis. So clearly culture for mycobacterium leprae is, is not uh, a true diagnostic um, strategy there. And for mycobacterium ulcerans, um, it is somewhere in between mycobacterium TB and mycobacterium leprae. It does not grow very well in culture, although it does. Uh, it has a slower doubling time than mycobacterium TB and culture again is not widely used um, for the outgrowth of mycobacterium ulcerans. So those are the, the most, uh, microscopy and culture uh, provide a very direct uh, diagnostic strategy. Um, but clearly in the case of myco mycobacterial infections, uh, not readily attainable ones. Um, as an alternative strategy, uh, we can now look for pieces of the infecting mycobacterium, uh, the proteins or the lipids that uh, each of these pathogens sheds into the circulation. Uh, and the, the nice thing about uh, antibody, antigen detection systems is that we don't necessarily need to look at the actual site of infection. If the proteins or lipids are secreted from the mycobacteria, they can become systemic and be circulating in the blood. They can appear in the urine at times. Um, they can appear in nasal secretions and, uh, and other um, samples that are far easier to collect uh, than um, sputum samples or the um, punch biopsies. Classic antigen detection systems uh, are reliant on detection by antibodies, antibodies being specific to the antigen that we're trying to pick up. Uh, more recent systems have adapted um, reagents called aptamers, uh, which are comprised of reagents that simply um, are able to bind to the antigen of choice. So antigen detection systems uh, are becoming more widely available. Um, they are still predicated uh, on the ability to collect the sample. Uh, so we would still look within sputum samples of uh, TB patients uh, and then, or pleural fluid, uh, we would detect uh, either in this example with aptamers that can be labeled uh, to allow them to be detected uh, within plate-based formats by um, biosensors or by ELISA plate readers. Uh, and various systems are being adapted to uh, speed up our ability to detect antigens related to microbacterial infections. Um, in the case of TB, uh, there are a number of antigens that are uh, secreted in high levels. Um, ESET6 and CFP10 being predominant uh, within those that have been assessed from a diagnostic uh, standpoint. Do we have a question? Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so this serves as a, a proxy um, indicating that an individual has been infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. If we can detect um, 
proteins and lipids that are specific to MTD, uh, it would be a good diagnostic indicator. Um, similar systems um, have been assessed for mycobacterium leprae infection. Again, an impacting factor is the level of infection. If the infection is at a low level, uh, there is going to be less antigen that is circulating to allow detection. A more recent evolution of diagnostic testing is to detect nucleic acids, either the DNA of the pathogen or RNA. Um, DNA um, has its advantages because obviously it is a requirement within the microbacterium uh, and can be picked up quite readily. Uh, RNA has an advantage in that the RNA has to be produced from the DNA and therefore indicates a viability of the, um, the pathogen. Uh, and various systems have been used to begin to look at these. In fact, uh, the relative gold standard for tuberculosis infection is uh, a system called Gene Expert, uh, which is a nucleic acid detection system um, that involves the collection of sputum from a TB, a suspected TB patient, uh, mixing of the sputum sample with reagents that are loaded into um, standard cassettes. Um, this allows uh, DNA extraction and uh, therefore allows it to be amplified by polymerase chain reaction uh, events. Uh, and in the case of Gene Expert, this system has been automated um, such that these car bridges uh, are loaded with all the reagents. So after the sputum is loaded, there is no uh, sample handling beyond that point. And the system um, can run through samples in uh, under two hours to allow us to detect um, the presence of mycobacterium TB um, DNA. And it also um, has an added advantage in that um, the primer sets that are used uh, also assess the resistance or lack of resistance of the mycobacterium tuberculosis to rifampicin, the, the frontline drug for TB treatment. Um, as you can see, uh, even though this looks quite simple, um, there is a laboratory requirement here and there is a system up, upkeep requirement. Um, so someone who is familiar with using uh, the gene expert system uh, is a critical component of the diagnostic stream here. Alternative uh, to conventional polymerase chain reactions um, are loop mediated isothermal DNA amplification systems that are uh, fairly simplified um, relative to conventional PCR. Uh, they can be conducted in water baths. They don't require cycling. Uh, so it's a simple water bath with a continuous amplification process to generate um, a product from the introduced DNA or RNA. Um, so this can simplify the, the process and begin to uh, allow us to think about moving it out with a molecular biology laboratory to attain the diagnosis. For the enactment of uh, LAMP systems, uh, we need to inoculate the sample in the lysis buffer, incubate it for some time to extract that nucleic acid or, or open up the mycobacteria to release their nucleic acids uh, that are then subjected to this system where uh, a reaction mixture is added to the nucleic acid inoculated in a water bath, and then results can be interpreted by various different um, strategies. Um, the predominant one is the inclusion of a fluorescent dye so that positive samples become fluorescent versus negative samples that remain um, um, non-fluorescent. Um, they can also be subjected to conventional uh, real-time detection systems looking at the amplification rates. Uh, they can also be applied to lateral flow cytoma, uh, lateral flow assays or analyzed within gels. Um, so 
the goal of nucleic acid detection tests is to uh, amplify a, a piece of that genetic machinery of the microbacterium uh, to allow us to say that it was in the sample in the first place. An issue, uh, as I said, um, is the, the level of infection is highly impacting on the ability of nucleic acid detection tests um, to return a positive result. For leprosy patients, again, those individuals who are very heavily infected, lipomatous patients, uh, we can amplify the genetic material of Mycobacterium leprae uh, quite readily from samples within them. But as we come across the clinical spectrum into low level infected individuals, uh, unsurprisingly, we um, have more difficulty in detecting Mycobacterium leprae there. And again, in the case of Beruli ulcer, uh, where collection of the sample is highly impactful, um, because as the disease progresses within this necrotic lesion, uh, the skin is actually dying around the fringes of this. So even if there is pathogen there, um, it is non-living. So we will not be able to amplify RNA samples out of the, there, and that even, even the DNA is becoming decayed. Um, so we need to be very precise in the collection of sample for confirmation of Beruli ulcer uh, by both microscopy and even by nucleic acid detection tests. So in addition to the direct detection, as I said in the introduction, indirect detection systems where we can measure an immune response that the pathogen has induced um, provide us an alternative strategy. Um, this is advantageous even in the case of low level infections because the immune response essentially amplifies um, its um, recognition of the infection. So we can, um, or the infection itself will generate antibody responses, also T cell responses, um, that through collection of blood samples or samples from other places, we can actually assess, are there indications that this person has been infected based upon their immune response? And antibodies uh, are the relatively simplest manner of doing this. Um, if we consider um, infections, infection in leads to antigen presentation and induction of a B cell response, the uh, transition of that B cell into a plasma cell and secretion of antibodies. Uh, each of these steps involves exponential growth of these cells and, and therefore uh, secretion of large quantities of antibody. Um, this is also predicated on the ability of the pathogen to be recognized by helper T cells, CD4 positive T cells. Um, and these T cells recognize peptides uh, related to the protein antigens of the pathogen. And again, there is exponential growth of these helper T cells into memory T cells. Um, and the impact of this is that when they see the particular peptide again, uh, we have activation of the cells and secretion of cytokines that we can measure as a proxy indicator um, of these cells. So we need sufficient levels of infection to induce an immune response uh, and then relative to direct detection systems, um, the immune response is systemic. Um, we have antibodies in the circulation. We have T cells in the circulation that we can assess. Uh, do they let us know if the individual has been infected? The most standard detection system for antibodies is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. Uh, you've probably all seen these. If you haven't, um, they're standard within um, almost all immunology laboratories. Um, the requirement of an antibody detection system would be 
the identification of a suitable antigen target, the generation of antibodies against that target to allow us to adapt it up to a test. Um, the antigen is coded in the 96 or 384 well plate format um, and then go, undergoes conventional ELISA where uh, in a reference laboratory, the plates would be blocked for 30 minutes, uh, samples would be added usually in duplicates uh, so that we can have um, internal control on the quality of the reaction, um, detect the, the binding of the antibodies by a detection antibody, um, addition of a substrate, and then a colorimetric change that we can then read out um, on um, ELISA plate readers to get a quantitative assessment of the relative levels of antibody in the sample. The ELISA process can be simplified somewhat, and this is uh, achieved by various diagnostic companies uh, in, by the pre-coding of plates with antigens, and then the uh, joint addition of sample capture antibody, uh, detecting antibody, so that the assembly of the uh, detection system happens all at the same time. And this can lead to uh, the overall time of the ELISA being reduced from one day to somewhere in the region of 90 minutes. So again, just to reiterate that whole process and what is happening within the wells here, uh, we have um, uh, the detection of antibodies that bind specifically to the antigen uh, that we've coded onto the plate. In this case, unfortunately, I, I've listed out an antigen capture, ELISA, um, but it operates in the same way. Uh, we go through various washes. Uh, this can or cannot involve a microplate washer. Um, we need to add a substrate uh, for that enzymatic reaction to be revealed. Uh, we then need a microplate reader to be able to interpret what has happened in the plate and allow us to calculate results and have a quantification on there. Um, so clearly, Eliza, um, the time benefit can uh, or the time constraints can be reduced to some extent, but there is an essential laboratory requirement. Uh, so the sample needs to get from the patient who's presumably presenting in a clinic or elsewhere to uh, typically a reference lab for confirmation of this uh, diagnosis. This technology can also be adapted from a plate-based format. Um, the ELISA plate-based format into a lateral flow-based format. Um, and the easiest way to think about these is these are like uh, pregnancy tests. So what is happening in a lateral flow-based test is the antigen is coded in a line uh, on the test. Sample is, is added to a portal and it, then it actually is pulled through a nitrocellulose membrane and if there are antibodies in the sample, they will bind to the antigen uh, where it's been coded and will reveal a line. Um, so a lateral flow-based test is essentially um, a compartmentalized single well ELISA um, being run in the same time. And various controls are incorporated so that you can assess whether the test result is valid or not. Uh, the control line here simply picking up antibodies that have been added. Um, so we have antibodies in our circulation against various things in addition to uh, mycobacterium if we're infected with it. Uh, and these are picked up by that control line to confirm uh, the use. The beauty of the lateral flow-based system is that it does not have a laboratory requirement. Uh, these can be conducted uh, anywhere and they typically deliver results in a 15 minute system. The disadvantage over ELISA is that, as you can see, the result is generally there is a line or there is not a line. It can be quantified to some extent, but not to the same degree as an ELISA format. Um, so reiterating a lateral flow system, analyte is added, it pushes through the membrane. Uh, if antibodies that can bind to the coded protein are there. 
uh, it will be detected uh, and, and be able to be visualized. Again, impacting um, the ability to use these tests are the infection levels in the case of uh, leprosy patients, the lower their infection, uh, the lower their generation of an antibody response. Um, but as I say, the large benefit is that these tests can be conducted outside uh, reference laboratory and almost anywhere. Let's see, here's an example of that happening uh, in Africa. The tests can be uh, modified to provide some level of quantification uh, to a simple reader. Uh, many companies have developed up uh, smartphone readers uh, and adapters for this. Uh, so these operate in a manner similar to visualization of a band within a SDS page gel. So they measure the density or the intensity of the signal layer and can provide a number. Um, the robustness of this is not to the same extent as an ELISA plate reader, but it does expand it beyond a simple yes, no um, answer to the diagnostic question. Issues with regard to lateral flow-based tests for um, diagnosis of the diseases um, have been well-documented uh, for tuberculosis. Um, in 2011, the WHO issued its very first negative comment um, with regards to um, disease control systems, uh, where they actually um, issued uh, a large concern about the commercial tests that were being sold for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Um, as we can see here, statements were made that blood tests for TB are targeted at countries with weak regulatory mechanisms for diagnostics where questionable market incentives can override the welfare of patients. It's a multi-million dollar business centered on selling substandard tests with unreliable results. Uh, so what was happening in um, the TB field was that uh, within India, for example, there were over 100 lateral flow-based tests that were commercially available within private clinics for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Uh, a great many of these tests um, had only been assessed on, for example, 10 samples. Uh, to indicate that they were 90% sensitive for detection of the disease. Uh, when they were used in practice, there was no quality control uh, because of the lack of a diagnostic regulatory system. So people were paying lots of money for tests that um, they might as well flip the coin on. Um, and obviously, if somebody has been tested and being told they're negative, they're then going back into the population. They're going seeking a diagnosis of something else uh, and then finally, when they're given a quality test, uh, their diagnosis is made. So the WHO came out with this statement recommending that serodiagnostic tests, these lateral flow-based detection of antibodies, um, should not be part of the diagnostic uh, realm for TB. At that same time, uh, T-cell-based diagnostics were becoming available and were being developed uh, for mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. Um, so detecting another arm of the immune response uh, against the pathogen. Um, the pathogen, as I say, generating a memory T cell response uh, that upon re-exposure to the antigen uh, can secrete cytokines that can be measured um, to identify that the cells are responding. These tests fundamentally fall into two different formats. Um, one is a, what's called a quantiferon type test um, coined by the company that developed the test in the first place. What happens there is a sample of blood is collected from the suspected individual. Uh, that blood is incubated with a pool of peptides that are specific to mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, and then the, after one day or two days of incubation, plasma is withdrawn from that sample and then submitted to conventional ELISA, uh, measuring uh, 
the presence of interferon gamma within the plasma, that interferon gamma having been secreted by the cells responding to the peptide. And an alternative strategy um, that is very similar is a T-spot test uh, where the AND assay is actually an L-spot rather than L an ELISA. So the L-spot involves the immobilization of antigen within a, a gel, the addition of cells from the blood sample, the incubation of that for uh, 24 hours. And because the cells and protein are immobilized, uh, we can then detect the secretion of interferon gamma in a spot format by looking at the, these plates. So the quantiferon te tests for TB are commercialized. Uh, an important parameter here is that uh, it is not a, simply one tube uh, that is within that test. Uh, there needs to be a negative control um, to establish um, what an individual's baseline level of um, cytokine is. There needs to be a positive mitogenic control stimulating all of the T cells within the sample uh, to show that the sample can indeed even respond. Uh, and then the test sample in the case of uh, TB quantiferon it comprises um, peptides from ESAT6, CFP10, and TB7.7. Uh, overnight incubation of these three tubes, uh, we should see no response in the nil control sample, a large response in the mitogen control sample, and then in the test sample, uh, dependency upon if the individual is positive or negative for TB infection. TB spot also commercialized. Uh, as you can see, a variety of reagents come within that kit uh, needed to um, coat and layer up the L-spot plate, uh, which again needs to be run with a negative sample positive mitogenic control sample, and then our actual test samples where we can see spots uh, within the plate indicating the individual is infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. And then finally, um, more, much more generically, um, we can also assess a variety of biomarkers uh, in the circulation. Um, so without uh, a pathogen specific component to amplify these uh, within patients um, of all of these diseases, we can see perturbation or alterations in a variety of different cytokine markers or other um, metabolites. And these can be measured. Um, the downside of measuring these is that generally they are nonspecific and are actually related to the presenting symptoms of the disease um, rather than the infection per se. Uh, more recent advances uh, in molecular biology and genetic sequencing uh, has allowed the, or has on the cusp of a diagnostic realm, uh, the ability to measure immune signatures uh, within the individual. So a blood sample is extracted um, from the individual uh, can or in many cases does not need to be incubated with peptides or protein antigens um, to assess the, the presence of T cells. So, so deep sequencing allows us to assess the presence of, for example, T cells that are specific to CFP10 of mycobacterium TB. Um, these would be, if, if the individual had been infected, the exponential expansion of those T cells uh, would lead to an increased frequency of them in the relative T cell pool uh, and that diagnostic could potentially be made on the, um, the over-representation of these T cells relative to uninfected or healthy individuals. In addition to these uh, ex vivo T cell tests, 
uh, a very conventional uh, and in many ways the standard of um, TB diagnostics is the MAN2 test. Uh, this involves the inoculation of um, proteins into the skin uh, and then the recognition of an immune response against that introduced uh, antigen. What happens um, in the case of TB, uh, a protein called protein, uh, purified protein derivative is inoculated into the skin. Uh, and then a classic delayed type hypersensitivity response enacts where uh, T cells that are specific to um, components within that PPD are drawn to the site where it's inoculated. And this can lead, this leads to a blabbing and an induration at the site of inoculation. The size of that induration um, is related to the presence of protein specific T cells. Uh, so again, if an individual is infected, they will have an expanded T cell pool against the, the mycobacteria that are drawn into this site of inoculation. Um, so these tests have been used uh, for over a hundred years uh, and can be applied uh, within the field and are widely applied within clinics. Impacting the ability of, of individuals to respond is the quality of their overall immune response in immune compromised people uh, with decreased CD4 T cell counts. Uh, the induration size declines uh, such that there are actually two levels uh, used for diagnosis on the basis uh, of a tuberculin skin test as shown here. In healthy individuals, an induration of greater than 10 millimeters, it's indicated as positive in immune compromised HIV positive individuals, um, that parameter is taken lower to a five millimeter induration. There are simple um, issues with the introduction and enactment of a, a tuberculin skin test. Um, the, the predominant issues are the quality of the introduction of the antigen. Um, Clearly, we want to be able to measure a response on the surface of the skin. So the depth at which the, the antigen is introduced can critically impact the, our ability to measure um, those responses. Uh, it's very heavily recommended as to how to inoculate. Um, if the PPD is inoculated too shallow, uh, we're not going to see a response. If it's inoculated too deep, we're not going to see a response. Uh, so there is some movement to standardizing the ability to introduce um, the skin test antigens uh, through the use of standardized microneedles. Um, another confounding factor uh, to the use of tuberculin skin tests is the availability of purified protein derivative in the standard um, manufacture of that. Um, there are a variety of different purified protein derivatives used within different regions of the world. Um, and even within the United States, uh, there are a couple of companies market their purified protein derivative, but there have been regular interruptions in the supply of this material. So over the next couple of slides, um, one thing that, hold on. Over the next couple of slides, uh, I want to go uh, kind of beyond a, a basic research and even clinical research into uh, the impact of these diseases within particularly uh, tuberculosis control programs. Um, because all of these tests come at a variety of different costs. Each has their own um, different levels of sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity meaning their ability to actually detect the pathogen or, or, or assess a diagnostic response. If the sensitivity is low, that will lead to 
uh, many people being falsely uh, diagnosed or falsely un not diagnosed. Um, there is impact in terms of specificity in that there can be some cross reactivity with other mycobacteria or uh, other factors can impact the ability to detect the infection. Um, so analyses of the use of these different task platforms in the United States has been made. Um, the cost of these tests uh, to insurance companies um, comes in at various different levels. Uh, T-spot tests. Um, in 2013, uh, any individual um, being given a T-spot test, uh, those L-spot-based tests, um, that had an impact of $140 to the insurance company. Uh, the cheapest test at ten dollars uh, was a tuberculin skin test. Uh, it's important to note that these these costs factor in the the time of the person providing the test, the material costs of a reference laboratory or any support reagents. Um, so many tests are marketed as to uh, you can go and buy a T spot test for a lot less than one hundred and forty dollars. Uh, but that does not factor in the labor costs and the support costs uh, required for that. So skin testing markedly lower uh, in cost than these um, probably better fidelity ex vivo test systems um, for people. The impact of that is that even in the United States, these tuberculin skin tests uh, that are viewed as fairly rudimentary technology, old technology, um, nearly 90% of individuals suspected of having TB were being submitted, subjected to tuberculin skin testing uh, relative to these other tests that require uh, reference laboratories to run ELISA, to run LSPOTS, or to run nucleic acid detection systems. So on a basis of cost, tuberculin skin tests are widely used in the United States, although it's not broadly uh, publicized in scientific literature because it's such an old technology. The impact of such testing strategies um, uh, and the impact of um, poorer sensitivity and specificity though um, comes through in an overall uh, disease control program where a better, more quantitative, ta quantitative test can impact the, the overall cost. Um, tuberculin skin test does not have a particularly great sensitivity um, at present, uh, and that can lead to lots of false negative or false positive results, uh, and therefore a lack of treatment or uh, an overtreatment that impacts the cost to a program. And so the better the test in terms of specificity and sensitivity, the lower the end impact because we're not going to treat individuals who are wrongly diagnosed or who don't need uh, a treatment in the first place. Uh, and I'll just skip through that. These are the numbers coming out of the UK where cost analysis was made. Uh, and you can see that the impact of false positive results in a TB skin test and the subsequent treatment of those individuals comes at a very high cost relative to the lack of false positive tests coming through uh, in these uh, laboratory-based tests. So in sum, um, Diagnostic test formats, there are a great many of them. Uh, each has their own distinct advantages, their own distinct disadvantages. Uh, skin tests can be conducted out with a clinic setting. Lateral flow-based tests uh, can be detect, can be used without a, outside a clinical setting. Uh, so therefore, uh, appear more suitable for use of surveillance. Um, 
tests that show direct detection clearly uh, need an expert facility, uh, the collection of a biopsy. Um, culture, if it were attainable um, for mycobacterium leprae, if it was re um, reasonable for mycobacterium ulcerans would be advantageous. Um, but the constraints are introduced by the infection themselves there. Uh, and fundamentally, um, I want to come back to the question I asked uh, right at the beginning, where I asked everyone to can, uh, have an opinion as to what they thought the best diagnostic test format was. Uh, so many factors go into um, how a diagnostic test format is applied, how it is used. And it's my opinion that best has to be qualified by the need the, the use of the information coming out of the test and the ability of, of any particular region to apply such testing. Um, so gene expert is the gold standard for TB diagnosis throughout the world now. It's recommended by WHO. Uh, I can tell you that a great many laboratories have been supplied in Africa have been supplied with gene expert tests. Um, the, the cost of the machinery in the test has been uh, offset by donations by the Bill and Gates Melinda Fund, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, etc. Um, but in a many places, these gene expert systems are not being used because they don't have suitably trained personnel to keep the machines up. Uh, there are concerns that withdrawal of the supplementary funds will impact the, the long-term ability of use, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there when we think about where we are in the uh, diagnostic test realm. So th those are the slides I wanted to present. Those are the concepts and ideas that I wanted uh, to have people think about. I didn't want to go particularly into the science of the testing, but I, uh, from my perspective, it's important as scientists to consider how and why a test would actually be used um, because that can streamline us immediately in the way that we uh, build control programs, we build research programs, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dodi. Um, let's open now for video and or chat questions. Uh, we already have uh, some questions in the chat, but uh, if anyone want to, to make a video question, just hand up on the, on the, oh, how mutants. <laughs> Milton, <laughs> I didn't realize you were studying again. <laughs> <laughs> I would have changed so it's the always whole good presentation. To be... <laughs> <laughs> so it's always good to be this, in this side of the, <laughs> of the room. <laughs> Thanks, Malcolm. Very, very good presentation. I mean, very comprehensive and, and detailed. So, um, uh, but I, I mean, it's it's a very, very uh, interesting discussion. And uh, the, the the point that I would like to ask you is that, I mean, uh, I mean, you you went. I mean, I would like to make first a, a comment, and uh, it's interesting how of you course. managed to present um, all the techniques and the details of the methods, and then also presenting some uh, translational, how do we actually use that in the field, right? And, uh, and it's very, very important that, that you bring that up, especially for students, because sometimes uh, they don't understand, um, I mean, that actually, I mean, to develop uh, interferon gamma release assay or a serological assay is not only to have available in the lab, you have to make it you know, next to the patient, right? As a point of care um, test, and uh, and 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 it was very interesting also to to see the data on 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 WHO uh, rec not non recommendation of serological tests for TB. I mean, this is this is something that I always bring up as well because it's uh, I, I understand that the, I mean, if if you actually don't have a good test. Uh, I mean, you have to be very careful, and uh, I mean, and, and you have to take it seriously uh, uh, before you decide to use 
some specific types of uh, 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 of tests, right? And I mean, obviously, that uh, uh, I understand the specificities of each disease in TB and 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 leprosy, and and mycobacterium ulcerans. We are talking about neglected diseases, and it's always very difficult to develop these new tools and bring them uh, uh, to uh, uh, to the patients, right, or to their families, yeah. and um, and. Uh, and, and that, that's my question, actually. Uh, uh, I mean, considering, because obviously that we've been studying, for example, serological tests for uh, leprosy uh, using lateral flow assays for maybe what, maybe 30 years now, right? And, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, we, I mean we, we do have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, operationally, I mean, we do have a very, very interesting tool now. For example, we have the second generation DPP which is far better than the first generation uh, tests, right? And, uh, but I mean, do, do you think that we could improve sensitivity uh, using different antigens or combining different antigens or maybe using host and bacterial um, components to uh, actually to, to have a, a test that could detect both uh, uh, clinical forms of leprosy, or it's, it's just a matter of that because I mean, uh, because we, we've been studying that too long. And yeah, uh, is, is, is that a, a technical issue, or do you think that we could actually, um, and, and, we, and then we can, I mean, if, if we actually have you know a, a budgets and to develop, we will uh, we'll develop something better, or I mean, there's a, you know, a, it's a problem of the disease because we have a chronic disease with, you know, a, one spectrum have very low levels of, of antibodies. And so we, we won't detect it anyways. What do yeah. you think? <clears throat> so, boy, there's a lot of questions there. Uh, <laughs> so it is, it is very feasible to actually construct a T cell detection test conjoined with an antibody detection test. Um, so the quantiferin type assay, it's only a small volume, but it still needs to be an actual blood collection. Um, that is then collected, it's incubated with different antigens from MTB or MLEPRI. Uh, and one day later, plasma is withdrawn the presence of interferon gamma or other cytokines, uh, as we've shown, can be detected. Now, the antibodies don't disappear, so they're retained in that plasma. Uh, so at the same time as we're looking for interferon gamma, we can look for antibodies against different proteins or phenolic glycolipid 1 is the prototypic diagnostic for leprosy. The issue is a time one, because now you've taken the antibody detection can be done with a finger prick of blood. So it's non-invasive. It doesn't need a needle. I mean, it needs a, a lancet to be able to draw that blood sample. And it can be applied immediately into an ELISA or a lateral, lateral flow system. And the lateral flow system, you can envision poking the blood, putting it straight onto a test, getting results in 15 minutes. If we embed that T cell component, we have to wait a day. So there's removal of the result from the individual who's been tested. So we need to then go back to the individual, track them down, find them. So it becomes a management issue. Um, it's not insurmountable. It certainly garners a lot of information. Again, it goes to how are you going to use that information? Um, does it really matter if I'm antibody positive and you're going to diagnose me on that basis? Do I really need to know what my T cell response looks like? So it's, it's the quality of that information and how to handle it. Um, and it's an interesting thing in the context of quantiferon testing for TB. Uh, as I said, we, we conventionally think of that as collect the blood, blood into a tube analyze it. Immediately, we also have to collect that negative control tube. We have to collect a positive control tube. So 
we have three times, uh, fundamentally 66% of the cost relates to controls versus the actual test. But without having those controls, we can't assess the quality of the test. So there's a problem there. And again, there's a disconnect in the time constraint and the person leaving a clinic as having the return results to them and so on. Um, and that's one of uh, the reasons that within my research, we've actually, I would call it going backwards to a skin test situation. Because if somebody's got something happening on their arm, they're a lot more likely to come back to the clinic and go, what is happening on my arm? Whereas I got a blood draw yesterday, when do I get my results? It's, it's been very interesting in the age of COVID. Uh, in the United States, uh, I think this is a similar situation in Brazil and other countries, uh, the kind of deregulation of control of testing was made to expedite test availability. The issue was that then substandard tests were coming out. There's been such a mixed message in the public health system as to how results should be interpreted and what action should be taken with them. Uh, it's, it's diminished the ability of the test to really guide and control what happens. Um, because it, it's a confusing field. It's confusing to say we're going to diagnose somebody as infected, even though they're not displaying symptoms. Or somebody has symptoms, we would like an immediate, uh, the most rapid. So if somebody has symptoms, as I stated with TB, it's of not a huge amount of use to wait a one month to confirm the diagnosis by culture. Generally, what will happen is a clinician will start treating them for TB. And then it will be, okay, well, yeah, we confirmed it. How are we using that? It's, it's good information to have into the general public health system from that individual's perspective, that diagnostic strategy is almost meaningless. Um, I remember once being in India, uh, looking at cutaneous TB patients uh, and the diagnosis of cutaneous TB there is made by response to treatment. So a quality clinician says, I, I, this person has cutaneous tuberculosis, let's put them on rifampicin and other things. The lesion disappears and they go, yeah, they had tuberculosis. Now they can confirm it by microscopy and histopathology, but ultimately it's a retrospective diagnosis because of response to treatment. That's not a great system when we think about uh, generation of antibiotic resistance or inappropriate use of drugs, but it's what's done. It's, it's what's done in practice. Um, so, so it's important not to disconnect that ultimate use and that information from the purpose of the test is really what I want to bring home today. Uh, because as you say, um, we as scientists sit at the lab and we work up all of these tests and it's wonderful it works in our lab. The question is, does it work in someone else's lab? And beyond that, does it work outside a lab or in a reference lab or what, what are we going to do with it? Uh, now, I don't want to diminish anybody's research uh, because fundamentally we need to develop these tests and then be able to transition them to use. Exactly. But it's a two-way system. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a chat question here for uh, Lawrence. Um, the question is, even without to, uh, the need to assess the infection site for the detection of metabolic and antibody, that guarantee a uh, diagnosis wouldn't uh, it be more accurate to assess the site? Yeah. So the, the, the basic question, that, uh, the answer to that question is yes. A direct <laughs> diagnosis is much better because the pathogen is either there or it is not. In these indirect systems, um, now as Milton said, 
Mycobacterium leprae sets up a chronic infection. Uh, Mycobacterium TB sets up a chronic infection, but the immune response can, it can peak and it can wane. So um, you can get false negative results and false positive results. Rel again, thinking about what is the use of the test. If we want to treat symptoms, we need to deal with that. If somebody is asymptomatically infected, how do we use those results? Are we just, are we checking a box and saying, okay, 10% of the population now has COVID or has had COVID and so on. What is the, what is the long-term impact? If someone is diagnosed once, can they be diagnosed again? Or does that diagnostic persist? Um, and does that mean that we need to use, if someone is diagnosed as being antibody positive, so the next time we suspect they're actually maybe displaying symptoms, do we need to use a different test? Do we need to do a direct detection uh, because of the limitations of antibody persistence or persistence of a T cell response? So it's a, it's a very good question. It's a very nuanced answer. But ultimately, the best system is direct detection. And I say that as someone who's worked for a long time on indirect systems. It's just not always attainable. If we're in the Amazon, can we do a biopsy? Can we take it on a boat for a day to the reference clinic in Manaus? What is achievable? And what delivers the best outcome to the suspected patient? Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Ana Paula. Uh, Dr. Dutty, uh, you have collaborated with uh, Brazil to produce a new egret assay for leprosy. This is a uh, test read, right? Read. Uh, so the answer is no. Um, we need to conduct more research, um, again, taking it outside my laboratory and putting it in someone else's laboratory or a situation. Um, uh, and we're also actually working on a skin test for leprosy um, to address the gap of the, the need for laboratory support um, that an IGRA test uh, has. Um, so as I said, in many locations, uh, an IGRA, uh, you could conduct it, but you're gonna generate the results away from that site and then how do you get the information and impact back to uh, that particular region. Okay, so thank different you. test formats for different oh. situations. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we have another question from Andrea. Andrea. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dutty, uh, uh, for your presentation, very comprehensive. My question is regarding latent tuberculosis and indicator of disease reactivation. Is there any test designed specifically to detect latent TB individuals and more uh, importantly, latent infected individuals that are likely to reactive disease? So that's a great question because um, the tuberculin skin test um, will generally uh, be responsive in latent TB infected individuals. Um, and that impacts, again, um, I'm going to say it so many times, what do you do with that information? Because are you going to treat that individual? Um, the likelihood is not because they don't have active disease. Um, there, to the best of my knowledge, there is no predictor of, of disease reactivation. Um, but knowing that there T cell uh, skin test positive, um, it accelerates them in their uh, disease management. Um, one of the impacts, unfortunately, is that uh, within Brazil um, and everywhere outside the United States, people are immunized with uh, Mycobacterium bovis BCG, and that can lead to um, positive responsiveness in a skin test. Um, I'm an immigrant to the United States and I remember going through the green card process and they said, oh, we're going to have to give you a TB skin test. And I said, there's no point, I'm going to be positive. 
and the look on their faces was like, whoa, what's happening here? Like, I'm immunized, I'm going to be responsive. And they're just not used to that. Um, so they were wanting to use the test as an indicator of TB infection and, and likelihood of disease uh, as the immigration parameter. Um, but again, it's kind of misuse of that information. It's like, okay, I have a response that is actually a good thing because it means I'm responding to the infection or I have the capacity to respond to the infection. Um, so it becomes complicated uh, delineating these immune mediated diagnostics from what is actually beneficial to an individual. Uh, I don't know if I really answered the question there, but latent TB does cause issues with various diagnostic um, platforms. Um, and it impacts how the individual would be managed or that information would be treated. Um, and in terms of reactivation, I'm unaware. Um, Roberto is probably much more ably situated to answer. You can go in, Paula. Okay. Hi, Michael. Então, uh, this is a very important situation because most of the time, a person that has latent TB, they can respond to ESET-6, but they cannot respond to CFP-10 or TB-7.7. Uh, I am the case. For instance, I am PPD positive, and when I get to USA, I had to do my PPD test, and I was positive also, and they did an x-ray yeah. to see if I had any lesion, and they want to start to treat me, and I didn't allow them, and then I yeah. have to sign a, a paper saying that I didn't want to get to, to ISO, ISO niacide treatment because I didn't have TB, exactly. and my lungs are clean, so I don't have infection whatsoever. But I have a lot of CD4 interferon gamma positive response for ESET-6, but I don't have response to CFP10 and TB7.7. Yeah. Then maybe one of the goals uh, should be to define a very good biomarker that can define who would have a subclinical TB infection that will um, develop active tuberculosis from those that was in contact with TB, uh, did a very good um, immune response and will never have tuberculosis. But uh, uh, to have a test that could differentiate between those that have the good immune response from those that could reactivate the, the infection or are subclinical. Because nowadays they, they only, they do not classify tuberculosis only as active TB and latent TB. Yeah. They, they say that we can have a nebulous uh, phase that you are not latent or ne and neither active and you have a subclinical infection that they cannot uh, assess by clinical tests, but you can develop active TB. And we, I think that we, we still need a, a good test to, to find those persons with tuberculosis. What do you think? Uh, I completely agree. Uh, it's a very difficult situation um, to identify if, I mean, the fundamental question is, is the immune response uh, of individuals who are going to reactivate different from those who are not? Mm -hmm. um, and there is so much, uh, as you've already indicated in your question, there's so much overlap in the response. The, the, the question is, is there, are there a couple of antigens that are not recognized in those that are going to reactivate? Um, and mm -hmm. it's unclear. Um, yeah. this and also may, it's this, unclear it's the biomarkers. We don't have biomarkers that could say, which one will develop active tuberculosis? Yeah. And when you try to, we try to find the biomarkers of vaccine protection or biomarkers of tuberculosis protections, they are the same. Exactly. Person that has disease has the same biomarkers as the one that will be protected by a vaccine. 
that's a very difficult field to work. Yeah, it's, it's an area that I think the deep sequencing of T cell and antibody responses may reveal. Um, because there, I mean, there are so many components and genes within MTB uh, that to actually go through them by traditional immune antigen recall assays um, is very cumbersome. You need um, high quality samples from very well defined individuals. Uh, and as I say, the, the genetic signature of T cell receptors and the frequency of T cell receptors, it may be that there's an ability with deep sequencing to actually differentiate reactivation from um, individuals who are going to contain the infection uh, over time. But right now, I think we're just con we're constrained uh, in one manner by our ability to produce all of the reagents because we're going to generate in a scientific realm, you're going to generate a lot of data that is either negative or the same, which is never appealing for funders, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and then the other impacting factor is uh, I would envisage you would have to track a large number of individuals over time. Mm -hmm because a simple assessment of those that have reactivated versus those that mm -hmm. have not could identify some signals, but we don't mm -hmm. know historically if they were different. Mm -hmm. it's tough. At, at, at some point, Dr. Ian Norm once came to mm -hmm. Brazil and he told me, Ana Paula, I believe that MTB just put to everywhere all the antigens that uh, will fake the immune response, make the immune response to do interferon gamma against not good uh, antigens that will not will do anything against tuberculosis yeah. and the important antigen <laughs> we are missing somewhere or the important yeah. uh, uh, response or the important components we don't know what it is because uh, MTB is is is, hi is hiding what it is important and we keep finding the main antigens, the main proteins, the main products to, to do our diagnosis tests, and we are missing something on the way. Yeah, I think you bring up an interesting point, which is uh, relative to vaccine development and what is truly associated with a protective response. Diagnostics is simple. Um, because there are so many things that induce that immune response, and that's fundamentally what you want to ask. Um, now, in a diagnostic realm, what is being seen in an indirect system is, uh, to my mind, it, it doesn't matter. Um, as long as it indicates the infection. It, it, so the questions are different, but it, it is impactful because as vaccines become available and as we, I mean, BCGs in the realm in Brazil all over, that sets a threshold and it adjusts our ability to use other things in the diagnostic realm. So it becomes, so, it's intertwined. It's again, to go to COVID, uh, I wanted to focus on mycobacteria obviously, but it, as it relates to COVID, all of the vaccines um, that are coming through are against the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. Um, now, that impacts the diagnostics because you don't want to use that target within your diagnostic Yeah. because you don't want to confuse a vaccine. We can diagnose people who diagnose people that have been vaccinated. Well, wonderful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's good. Actually, you confirm their diet, they're immunized, but mm -hmm. you want to be able to differentiate vaccinated individuals from infected individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and that to some extent, um, Diagnostics are easier, but it's useful to think about how a vaccine may advance because you would not want to, uh, it's actually one of the issues with quantiferon, the use of CFP10 and ESAT6 in there. They've been used within diagnostic mm -hmm. platforms. Yeah. So if those vaccines become prevalent, that diagnostic platform mm -hmm. becomes meaningless. Yeah. Uh, so which do you put to the side, the diagnostic or the vaccine? <laughs> 
an open question. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, thank you. We have uh, more questions here in the chat uh, from Danusa. Um, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Malcolm, for your clear presentation. Uh, do you believe that T cell test uh, is a, the quant quantiferon, but it's not for only interferon gamma detection, but with uh, other molecules like reactive uh, reactivity protein, IL-6, etc. Et is enough to discrimination uh, discriminate a classical lipromatosis leprosy patients uh, than in a NL, NL patients, uh, reaction patients? Boy. I think Danusa has been reading my papers. Um, yes, I think a variety of different markers can be used. Um, interferon gamma uh, has led the field because it's, uh, it's the predominant cytokine secreted from T helper one type T cells um, in microbacterial infections. Interferon, that profile is related to protection against the pathogen. Uh, but I believe pretty much this goes to it doesn't matter what is being measured as long as you can measure it um, and it's specific. Uh, so I believe there are a host of other parameters that may actually be better than interferon gamma. Um, we haven't identified it to date, but uh, I believe it's there. The issue with using a cytokine such as IL-6, which is part of the antigen-specific immune response, is that it is also a, an acute phase protein. So in any inflammatory situation, there's a large amount of IL-6 being produced and in the circulation. So there can be more background there. So that differentiation of a true antigen-specific response versus a background response becomes more complicated. So you would like the ideal marker would be one that is only present upon an antigen specific immune response. But that, that is a very simple and clean thing to model in experimentally infected animals and so on. But in the real world where we're going about our business, we're seeing a lot of different things. We have fluctuation in circulating cytokine levels because we have other things going on. And that's, that's why I believe biomarkers without um, an antigen specific component are very limited because of all of these other impacting events. Uh, C-reactive protein, again, uh, just a general inflammatory response is gonna give you that. So to, if someone is having, presumably someone's having symptoms to turn up at a clinic, the symptoms for all of these diseases can be quite generic unless they're very advanced diseases. Um, so being able to differentiate a, a true component is tough. So uh, we have one more question in the chat uh, from Roberta. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, in the last years, we have uh, an advanced in technological issues uh, regarding diagnosis of infection disease. However, do you believe that that we know is sufficient about the immunopathology of microbacterial disease? In the, my point of view, the diagnosis of latent TB and the early leprosy diagnostics are complicated because we had we did not have a good biomarkers. What do you think? I agree. <laughs> um, it's a little bit chicken and egg um, because we, we need better tools to understand the immunopathology. Um, we need a limitation of the development of much, many of the diagnostics is that in the development process, we use clean and defined samples, which they're clean and they're defined because we've been able to do so in a clinic. We've been able to define lepromatous leprosy patients. We've been able to define true tuberculoid patients. And we select those and we expand upon them. That's not the fundamental diagnostic issue though. The diagnostic issue is, I always drive clinicians crazy when I do presentations because I'd say that 
they're not experts and, and they need to listen to us as scientists, but a patient will appear and they don't have a clue unless they're very clearly the advanced cases. Now the diagnostics that we're trying to develop want to detect the disease much earlier so we can actually prevent the disease from advancing. So we need almost undefined samples to really test diagnostics as they're going through the development stages. But we have to work within the parameters we have. It's an issue, particularly with leprosy, where we can't culture mycobacterium leprae from an individual. So we're limited um, to defining them by immunohistopathology and so on. And then we say, oh, this is the profile that these individuals have in their immune systems. What we need to do is go, here's the immune profile. How does that relate? We, we take that information, we look at the immune profile, or we look at circulating antigen or so on. And then we need to feed that back to what does that mean in the real world, where people are not classic lepromatous patients, classic tuberculoid patients. Uh, and it gets complicated. The same situation with TB. This is a symptomatic TB patient. They're different from latent TB infected individuals. How do we, def we define them on the basis of their infection levels or so on? So we're almost using diagnostics to define them and then asking for a diagnostic to improve upon the diagnostic that we've used. It's a complicated process to do that. Um, but it is done to some extent within TB management, leprosy management, where fundamentally various diagnostic tests are layered on each other. We could run an antibody test for leprosy that provides a suspicion or a high level of suspicion that then says, let's do immunohistochemistry on this individual. We'll, I now feel better about taking a punch biopsy from this person because in the last 15 minutes, I've learned that they have a strong antibody response to mycobacterium leprae. Um, so we, obviously that enhances costs, but if it reduces cost of treatment, there, there's a balance and act that's beneficial there. So oh, thank you, uh, but I, I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, the diagnosis for infection by another kind of mycobacteria, like mm -hmm. uh, typical mycobacteria, uh, with causes lung infections, is usually made by the collection of spoon too. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, this uh, search for antigens can facilitate the detection or prevent the false positive for tuberculosis? Or uh, do you know if the, it's already been applied to any antigens or any atypical mycobacteria? So I believe there's quite a bit of research going on in that area. Uh, I don't believe it's a, been applied in advance through to, um, sorry. Uh, I don't believe it's been advanced through to actual true diagnostic testing. Um, the issue with all of these mycobacteria is that um, they share an awful lot of common genes. Um, so there is an impact of um, the use of bioinformatics to select things that are different and then look at those. Um, I will preface that by saying that we, um, my group developed an antibody mediated diagnostic for leprosy that contains two proteins with a significant amount of homology with mycobacterium tuberculosis. TB patients do not respond to those tests. So we can use bioinformatics to filter out and select genes that are specific to the pathogen. But I think it's also really important to think about, I showed you three, di three mycobacterial diseases, tuberculosis, leprosy, Baruli ulcer. They present completely differently. So the biology is also very different. So although they have very similar genetic machinery, how they use that genetic machinery is very different. So their antigen profiles are very different. Um, 
So there, it's another level of complexity that uh, has to be thought about and considered. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Does anyone have more questions to me? No, no. Okay, uh, well, thank you again for your presentation. It's very instructive for me and probably for everybody. And if you, Roberta or Ana Paula, want to talk something more. Yes, thank you very much, Malcolm. It was very, very excellent, your presentation. You. Thank you. Yes, I hope people come next Tuesday because next Tuesday, Next Tuesday, we have Dr. André Kipnis that will talk about nutritional immunity against mycobacteria, competition for iron during mycobacterial infection. So thank you very much. Stay thank safe. You, thank and you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, Malcolm. Bye-bye.